Welcome to Tuesday Talks. I'm Seema Kumar, and today we're diving into a topic that affects millions of women worldwide. Did you know that one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetimes? It's a staggering number, but today we're sharing a story of survival, resilience, and hope. Joining us today is an extraordinary guest, somebody who I've admired for a very long time, Kristen Dahlgren, a former NBC and Today Show correspondent, award-winning journalist turned biotech entrepreneur, who's currently the founder and CEO of the Cancer Vaccine Coalition. She's gonna share her journey of beating cancer, tell us about her team's groundbreaking advancement in creating a vaccine that may be the answer to cancer, breast cancer. Before we talk to Kristen, I wanna play a video that shows you a little bit about Kristen's efforts in building the Cancer Vaccine Coalition. Why is a journalist working on curing cancer? I say, why not all of us? Cancer changed my life in ways I could never imagine. I was 47 at the height of my career as an NBC correspondent. I had a three-year-old and then the bottom completely fell out. Chemo was tough, amputating my breasts even harder. To this day, I feel like I'm in someone else's body. I've had six surgeries. I have lymphedema, I have lung fibrosis. I still have trouble raising my right arm. And for me, the worst part is that every single day, I worry about it coming back. When I learned that vaccines were not just a pipe dream, but in clinical trials showing promising results and nobody knew about it, I had to do something. Cancer Vaccine Coalition is supporting the researchers and the science to get vaccines for treatment and maybe prevention sooner. My little girl needs her mom. Give me a shot to be here for all of her milestones. So many of us can't afford to wait. Please give us, give the people you love a shot. Together, we can do this. Give us a shot, Cancer Vaccine Coalition. Kristen, welcome. Welcome to Cure. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, that's part of our Give Us a Shot campaign. We're asking people to send in their own versions because we all deserve a shot at better treatments and better outcomes. Absolutely. And not just cure, but also prevention. Now, you were diagnosed in 2019 with a very special type of breast cancer known as invasive ductal carcinoma. Tell us about your journey. What kind of a cancer was it? How did you find out? Right, so I had invasive ductal carcinoma with lobular features, so it had a little bit of both types and was acting a little bit different than my oncologist thought um, was expecting, I guess. And so we were aggressive mm -hmm. with treatment. Um, I found my own cancer. It was my 47th birthday. I noticed a dent in my breast. and. Because I had done a story on NBC Nightly News a few years prior about how not everyone presents with a lump, mm -hmm. so I was expecting to feel that you know acorn or marble, but it was something different, mm -hmm. and so I got it checked out. Um, I was actually covering a hurricane, <laughs> and I knew that it was something, so I called the local hospital on the Outer Banks, and I said, this is going to sound strange, but can I come in and get a mammogram and ultrasound? And they said, well, why don't you wait until you get home? And I said, no, this is just something that I need to get checked out. It turned out it was um, stage two breast cancer. I had just had a mammogram four or five months before that was clean, and so I think that was a big message at the start of this for me was know your body. If there's something different, you know, please get it checked out because sometimes it is something. And it presents in different ways. Right. So knowing your body and knowing that something like a dent, uh, you know, is something that seems and signals that something's wrong is an important thing to do. And you didn't wait too long, you know, while you're covering the hurricane. <laughs> storm brewing inside of you and you decided to go get it checked out, which is great. Yeah, yes, exactly. You know, sometimes you just know that there's something off 
I think a lot of times you can be your own advocate and say this is something, even though you're telling me wait until I get home, this is something that I need to get checked out. So once you got the diagnosis, what happened then and how long before you had to go through surgery and chemotherapy and all of that, what was that like? Um, we knew after that ultrasound that it was most likely breast cancer. Um, so the next day I flew home and I got a biopsy. It turned out that it was this, um, you know, it had moved into my lymph nodes already. Uh, I ended up having multifocal, so several tumors mm -hmm. in my breast that we were able to see on imaging after that. And we decided to treat it aggressively. So I did um, ACT chemo, mm -hmm. AC known as the red devil. So mm -hmm. not a, a whole lot of fun if you can gather anything by the name. Um, and, you know, Taxol, which also does a number on your body. But mm -hmm. I was grateful mm -hmm. um, for those treatment options. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I went through a prophylactic double mastectomy and 25 radiation treatments, you know, in chemically induced menopause, and am still on hormone blocking therapy. So it's an ongoing thing. And you still, you, like you said in the video, you're still afraid it's gonna, it's not gonna come back. So it's never really over, over. Although you went very hard at it, right? Yeah. yeah, but I think um, once you have cancer and you've seen your mortality sort of laid out in front of you, you know that, you know, terrible things can happen. And I hear from people every day who were like me or even earlier stage and their cancer did come back. So, you know, I know that it can happen. I try not to let that anxiety rule my life, but every ache and pain that I have, my doctor said to me, after breast cancer, a headache is never just a headache. And so my mind does go to those thoughts, and I think I'm not alone in that. What was your experience as a patient, and what was the moment that actually led you to say, I need to get involved, and I need to try to find a cure? I mean, I think immediately I knew because I had done that story that I could help other people in learning to know your own body and to pay attention to your own body. So I became an advocate pretty quickly. I decided to share my story. So in December of 2019, I went on the Today Show. I showed that bald picture. And um, you know, I started talking about my cancer to help other people. And it really just evolved from there. And through my reporting on cancer, because I then became NBC's de facto cancer correspondent mm -hmm. and was assigned a lot of things since I did have that empathy for patients, I was introduced to doctors who were working on breast cancer vaccines. And it absolutely blew my mind that this was happening. And I, as a medical correspondent, as a survivor, had no idea that any of this was happening. Wow, that is just amazing, interesting, but also distressing, right? Because how much time and effort we're spending on breast cancer awareness and all the research that's going on into it. Right. And we, you know, <laughs> it's not common knowledge that there's vaccines actually in development, and that's why you founded the right. Cancer Vaccine Coalition. So I like to call October Breast Cancer Vaccine Awareness Month. Yes. Look, we're all aware of breast cancer. You had that statistic that one in eight of us in this country, and the statistics in other countries are, are much worse, yes. are going to be diagnosed with breast cancer. And we've normalized that. We're all so aware of it that when another friend, a relative is diagnosed, I don't even think we always like acknowledge Understand. that yeah. this is really happening to a lot of people and there are better things in the works. And so when I found out that this cancer vaccine research was going on, I knew that I had to do something because the way I saw it, the research is happening, those brilliant scientists are working on it, but the fact that we didn't have that awareness, that people weren't talking about it, that it wasn't on the front page of every newspaper, I really thought that there was something that I could bring to this effort. And so very quickly we got this group of scientists together, this coalition, the top breast cancer and vaccine oncologists in the world and they're working together, talking, sharing what they're working on in the hopes that things could move faster. So we got them out of their silos and that was you know, the first step and we've just been building it since then. That's great, so you've got people from Cleveland Clinic, MD Anderson and many others, right? Yeah. Memorial as part of the Memorial Dana Farber, Dana Farber, University of Washington, it's, yeah. you name it. Yeah. yeah, you know, this is really a groundbreaking 
initiative. How do you propose to work on this initiative and take it forward and, you know, bring it to more people and, you know, create the kind of same sense of urgency that we had with the COVID-19 vaccine initiative? Right. And you mentioned that that's a great example for us. So we took 10 years of research. We condensed it into eight months. The mRNA vaccines that were so helpful for the COVID vaccine were actually first in development for cancer vaccines. And so that was pivoted uh, to develop the COVID vaccine. And so now people are going back to the cancer vaccine research. Our idea was to get all the scientists, but really we need to get the top minds in so many different areas together on this initiative. So, you know, in finance, in communications, in getting the Regulatory. Word out, in government, regulatory, exactly. Yes. Every huge project in history really has been a coalition, if you think about it, working on it, the moonshot, you know, all of these things. And so the idea is to get the smartest people into a room or a Zoom room mm -hmm. And, you know, begin really chipping away at how can we get this done sooner? This is happening in the UK right now. So they have their cancer vaccine launch pad. It's a national effort. They're working with pharmaceutical companies. They are giving 10,000 cancer vaccines, not just in breast cancer, but in other cancers as well, in large scale trials. We're not doing that here yet. And we really could be. And so I'm doing what I can to shout it from the rooftops, to bring in people like you, like Cure, and try and build this coalition because all of us are impacted by cancer. And so I really think that if all of us stand up and say, we can do better, we can move this science forward faster through clinical trials, many of them are in phase two already, we just need to move it faster, and that will save hundreds of thousands of lives. That's uh, incredible, you know, and, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, during the whole two-year time frame uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we learned a lot about vaccines, you know, RNA vaccines, adenovector vaccines, one shot, two shot, all of the above. Tell us a little bit about the, the cancer vaccines uh, that are now in the, in the lab, uh, in development, in phase two, as you mentioned, what kind of technologies are they? Are they diverse, the same type of technology? No, so there's, you know, there are different ones in development. Um, some are still working on peptide vaccines. At the University of Washington, they have really promising DNA vaccines. And just to give you an example of some of the science there, um, they had a DNA vaccine 10 years ago for HER2 positive breast cancer, which is a subtype of breast cancer, given to 66 women. So a small study, they were looking at dosing as well. Those that got the middle dose, which ended up being the optimal dose, 85% of those women are still alive more than 10 years out when their median survival at late stage HER2 positive breast cancer was five years. Wow. So they haven't even been able to calculate median survival yet because so many are still alive. Even at the doses, the, the lower and the higher dose, which weren't quite as effective, 75% are still alive. So really promising research. At Cleveland Clinic, they're looking at alpha-lactalbumin, which is a protein that's produced when women are lactating. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be thereafter, but they are seeing it very high when someone has triple negative breast cancer. So that's what they're attacking. And so it's all of this different research happening, but what we're able to do is by bringing those scientists together to talk about it, they're able to build on each other's successes, learn from each other. We're not repeating steps that may not have worked in the past. And so the hope is that we can continue to do that. And then we're also working on funding because unfortunately that phase two area is often called the valley of death for yes. vaccines. And so you've gotten your early maybe um, defense department funding and you haven't been picked up by pharmaceutical yet. So that phase two, if we at Cancer Vaccine Coalition can provide the funding for those trials to get a little more data and advance it, that's what we're going to do. And so we really are attacking this from just every front that we can to support the science, to build an ecosystem where these vaccines can move through much quicker. And of course, October is Breast Cancer Month and we're focused on breast cancer and you're a breast cancer survivor and advocate, but these vaccines exist for other types of cancer as, as well, right? right? And what are some of the exciting findings, not just in breast cancer, yes, in breast cancer, but also in other cancers? 
in these vaccines that are still in development. Yeah, so super exciting stuff. So I know Memorial Sloan Kettering is working on a personalized vaccine mm -hmm. for pancreatic cancer. So something, you know, a, a type of cancer that was always seen as really just the worst that you could get. Yes. And they're seeing promising phase one results in those personalized vaccines. So that's taking someone's individual tumor, building a vaccine just for that person, and then giving it to them and they're seeing great results. Uh, there are colorectal cancer vaccines mm -hmm. in development, glioblastoma vaccines. We're expecting to see a melanoma vaccine to market in 2025. So in the coming year, there is going to be a melanoma vaccine if all goes according to plan. And so it really is this promising research. And the scientists explain it to me as this tipping point. So cancer vaccines, people have been talking about mm -hmm. trying to develop them for a long, long time. time. There yeah. were failures. Yeah. But this moment in particular is being called a tipping point because we have a few things. We have a better understanding of the immune system than we mm -hmm. ever have. We have a better understanding of what antigens we can target on a cancer in order to train the immune system to seek that out and to eliminate it. And then we do have these better vaccine technologies that were developed during COVID. These um, can be treatment vaccines. Or preventative. Or preventative. So yes. they're trialing some of them in patients that are high risk, like BRCA positive mm -hmm. patients. I know the word vaccine has become, you know, something that gets a lot of debate. Mm -hmm. These will never be mandated. This would be something that your oncologist would recommend either in, in addition to standard of care or maybe someday instead of. And, you know, for someone who went through standard of care, which was things that were developed, you know, quite some time ago and we're still doing as far as amputating yeah. breasts Taxol, I mean. Exactly. How does Taxol, yeah. Right. So, you know, we, you know, we're applauding these increases in survival rates in breast cancer. That really hasn't changed in quite some time. And so it's time for this future. It's time to lean in to this new technology, these new treatment options, potentially prevention. You saw my little girl there. I would love to have a vaccine so she doesn't have to worry about this disease and doesn't have to go through what I did. That's phenomenal, you know, and I think, as you said, the trials are costly, so we need funding. And it's so great that you're bringing the coalition together because, you know, part of what worked during COVID was everybody coming together, mm -hmm. right? Not competing, but collaborating. So that right. that's a great thing. But then there is still remains this question of manufacturing, right? And there we kind of, you know, had a few stumbles in the past. So how do we get through the manufacturing difficulties and how do we get them effectively to patients uh, you know, how do we make sure that your coalition is set up for success? Right. And that's going to be partnerships again. Yes. I mean, I think finding the right partners to do this. So we have the academics that are working on the research, the earlier stage research. Um, pharmaceutical companies also trying to develop their own cancer vaccines as well. So that's happening. And then we need to help it through the approval process. And you're right. It needs to be scaled. We need to have manufacturer that gets it to everyone. So we're trying to bring in those partners as well. And if we can get everything set up, then as soon as we get you know, the data from these phase two trials, we can send those into phase three, large scale trials, get those results as quickly as possible, and then start getting these vaccines into the arms of people who need them. And the doctors are telling me five to 10 years or less is not too ambitious a goal. And I truly believe that. Yeah, because when did we declare the war on cancer? Nixon declared the war on <laughs> cancer in 1975, right? right. It's been, so it's a, it's it's been, been long enough. It's been like, long we enough. We need to win this war, right? We need to win this war, exactly, right. Now, you said this is a tipping point, it's a moment. Why, why do you think that? You know, I feel like the science part of it is under control. We have these brilliant minds, and if they can just get these vaccines into those trials, to prove that they're effective. They've already done, in many cases, the phase one. So we know they're safe. We know that you know people are getting maybe a little redness around the injection site, the things that you would see with like a flu vaccine or a COVID vaccine. Now we need to you know see the dosing, which we're starting to figure out, 
And then it has to be compared to standard of care alone. A lot of these trials, people are still getting standard of care or still getting you know, some type of medication along with the vaccine. And they're trialing it in all different. They're trialing it in metastatic disease, mm -hmm. in all subtypes. We have one vaccine that we're really excited about at the University of Washington called StemVac. That is a vaccine to target cancer stem cells. It's subtype agnostic and it's disease agnostic. So wow. it's being trialed in non-small cell lung cancer at the same time it's being trialed in breast cancer. Wow. Targeting five proteins on a cancer stem cell. Just imagine Why? if we can get that to market across different diseases, off the shelf, low cost vaccines in a place like Africa where there's no diagnostics, no treatment, that would be transformational. Absolutely, that would be just phenomenally transformational. And as you said, here back here in the United States, uh, you know, one of the big difficulties we had with the COVID-19 vaccine, well, there was a positive in the sense that, as you said, it's a moment now where people are used to this notion of vaccines. Mm -hmm. Before that, you know, because we were in a state that we were in, vaccines weren't like front and center on people's uh, consciousness. That's number one. Number two, this is not a mandated, you must take this vaccine or you can't leave the house. This is much more about, you know, this is another option, you know, in addition to double mastectomies or in lieu of double mastectomies right. and, you I know, mean, like all and your radiation exactly. and all that. Right? I would yeah. have much preferred to have my own immune system mounting this really effective defense against cancer versus, you know, chopping off a part of my body that I no longer feel anymore and having those toxic chemicals pumped into my body. I feel like a lot of what I'm doing because it is that word vaccine is combating misinformation. So the other thing is, you know, we're not cutting corners. We're not trying to, when I say accelerate the process, it's not in an unsafe way. It's just, if you need a trial of say 4,000 people, we can enroll that trial more quickly. You're still gonna get the data from 4,000 people, but we don't have to wait. One of the clinicians said, okay, well, we're enrolling like maybe one every few months. And I'm like, well, why? You know, we don't have to take a year yeah. to enroll this. We're also making these connections. So University of Washington is adding Roswell Park, which we introduced as a second site for one of their vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so that's really exciting because you can enroll more, more people. Patient. So it's that type of acceleration that we're talking about. Enrolling the trials faster, spreading the word so people know what's out there, that's what moves it quicker. It's still just as safe, you're still getting the same number of people, the same data. So how does the story end? I'm gonna go back to your the, the beautiful t-shirt you were wearing. So no spoiler alert. How does the, right. how does the story end? You know, it ends with a happy ending. I get letters from people every day who need this now. And like I said, they don't have the time for weight. And that's just crushing to me. And so, you know, I carry a big weight on wanting to get this as quickly as possible for people. I have been told, this is, you know, people who are much smarter than me, the scientists, that vaccines are coming. You know, the World Economic Forum called this, mm -hmm. you know, this, this amazing moment in history where we're actually doing this and moving cancer vaccines forward. But it could be 20 or 25 or 30 years. Or if we just help it along, if we get all the stakeholders into the same room, we could do it in that five to 10 years or less. And just think about, like in our lifetimes, really a cancer-free future or cancer, you know, wouldn't be killing people. Maybe it's just a chronic illness. So we all can do our part to move this forward. We are gonna supercharge the coalition and bring a bunch of people together, key people, right? And uh, to your point, one of my ex-colleagues um, who's an extraordinary cancer a leader and researcher and physician uh, used to have a vision for a world without cancer, a world without disease. And that's what we all look forward to, a world without cancer. I get chills, you know, because I think it's coming. I think we're going to see it. And it's really just up to all of us how quickly we see that. And so it is, if we stand up 
and insist on better options, and they're out there. Yep. We can get this done. And so, you know, everybody has the ability to spread the word. Um, a lot of people have the ability to make donations and, you know, get the money mm -hmm. to this research. And there are people in powerful positions who we're going to bring on board. I've been to the White House twice. I've, you know, talked to NIH, NCI. I'm going to keep... Keep Rattling knocking on the cages, doors, exactly. bringing everybody together. <laughs> yes, a coalition of the willing who want to change the world yeah. for a cancer-free world. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. This has been a wonderful conversation, and we look forward to it. And thank you for all the great work you're doing and your advocacy. And for more information on Kristen and the Cancer Vaccine Coalition, visit www.wewillcure.com. Thank you all for joining us today live for Tuesday Talks. We'll see you again next Tuesday.